Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So it's a little bit chilly out here in my garage. We're close to about zero degrees at the moment, centigrade, which is fairly cold um, for the UK. Hence, I've got my coat on, but actually that works quite well for the purposes of this video because the subject that I want to talk about is penetration, uh, but specifically getting past clothes. And you know, I've talked about this many times in previous videos, but I was um, thinking about this in application to the spadroon the other day. That's right, the, the spadroon is back. Um, it's a hot topic at the moment. Um, and one of the things that I often talk about in my videos, and I try to impress upon my um, viewers, you, um, is that we can't always get everything uh, in one weapon, okay? There are compromises that need to be made. You can't have the best cutting sword uh, also combined with the best thrusting sword, also combined with something which is really quick in defense against bayonets, for example, or something which is easy to wear and easy to draw, and this kind of thing. So the length, the weight, the um, width, the curve, all of these characteristics of a sword, and you can apply this to any weapon, really. It even applies to firearms and all sorts of things are always a compromise. And some people talk about um, compromised design swords as being inherently um, inferior. Um, so I suppose you could call this a compromised des uh, design. It is not fully curved. It's not as broad as it could be. It, it, you can thrust with it, you can cut with it. And a lot of people talk about compromised designs um, as if they are somehow inherently lesser, uh, which is of course rubbish because obviously if you can combine enough qualities within a weapon or any implement, any tool really, uh, a Swiss army knife, if you can combine as many things into it as possible whilst it's still being relatively good at enough of those things, then that's great. Now the Spadroon, as we concede, is not the best cutter in the world, but how does this relate to the fact that I'm wearing a coat? Well, very simply, in Europe, in the, uh, well, let's face it, it, it throughout history, we, this could apply to the medieval period um, or the Dark Ages or perhaps even the Roman era in certain parts of Europe. Um, but uh, certainly, if we're talking about the 18th and 19th centuries, very often um, military personnel would be wearing a certain amount of clothing. Um, and very often they would be wearing winter coats, or at the very least, woolen military jackets. But let's say winter coats. Now, an example that I've used in previous videos, there we go, I donned the pith helmet for this. An example I've used in previous videos has been the Crimean War. There are some very famously well-documented examples from the Crimean war, and I've got a French um, light cavalry sword from that period. Um, there are documented accounts from the Crimean War, obviously some of which was fought during winter time against the Russians, so the primary forces were Britain, France and Russia. Um, there were a couple of other nations there as well, but they were the principal ones. Um, and there are several accounts of um, swords not making it through coats. Now the point that I have um, made in the past is, generally speaking, this applies to cuts. Now funnily enough, there is one account that even describes a thrust, a cavalry thrust, not getting through a Russian greatcoat. Now bear in mind the greatcoat would have been over a jacket, over a shirt, perhaps even some type of waistcoat or other layers of insulation in there as well. If you knew you were going into a fight, possibly you would put on all of your clothing, a bit like the old school school uh, kind of duff up where you'd stick on a load of jumpers to absorb some of the punishment, um, which is something that is even a bit before my time. Uh, it's kind of, um, but you hear stories about, you know, schools having fights against other schools and putting on lots of clothes and this kind of stuff. Anyway, um, but the fact is that winter clothing and lots of military clothing of the time could soak up a certain amount of punishment from hand weapons. But the general rule, whilst there is that one account of a thrust not getting through a jacket, I'm not going to push this very hard against myself because it might go through, um, generally speaking the smaller surface area against that clothing you can get, um, the better. And for that very simple reason and the sh shape and the blade geometry, points are easier to get through clothes and cuts. Also, the reason I stuck this pith helmet on is remember that most military personnel in this period would have had 
some form of headgear on, okay? Whether it's a pith helmet, whether it's a shako, maybe whether it's a kepi, a patrol hat, even a helmet, a metal helmet in the case of some um, cuirassiers and heavy cavalry um, and heavy dragoons and stuff like this. So headgear, okay? And this is the very reason, in fact, that John Musgrave Wade talks about cuts not being directed at the top of a person's head because your opponent, certainly in a military context, is almost always going to be wearing something on their head and he says to aim for basically the eye level downwards. In fact, even if the person doesn't have a helmet on, that's probably a good idea when aiming at the head because this, uh, if you're going to hit someone in the head, you're more likely to go through more of the head hitting down here than you are hitting up here. Uh, the skull is much thicker up here because evolution has made it that way to resist blows on the top of the head. Additionally, if a person moves their head slightly one side or the other, you might miss completely if you're aiming at the top of the head, whereas if you're aiming at the side of the head and they move the head, you're probably still going to hit it. Okay, I've made this point previously. But the main point that I want you to come away from this video with is that points are certainly within a, a northern European or just say European context, particularly in a winter context, uh, and additionally not just European, but you could apply this to Afghanistan, China, um, you know, various other, Canada even, you know, ver various other regions of the world where heavy clothing would have been warm. Obviously this doesn't apply to, you know, most of Africa through most of the year, or it doesn't apply to probably India for most of the year, um, but through a lot of the world, the point is particularly important because it will easily go through clothing. And you can test this for yourselves. You can go out, you can get a pumpkin or any other object, really an old, you know, I don't know, anything, um, an old pillow, and you put, you know, you could, you could practice cutting it, stabbing it, doing whatever you want to do to it. Then you can put clothing over the top. Now try cutting through that. And I know Scalagram has done a video where he put a jacket, just a normal walking out in the street jacket over one of the, um, uh, I think it was over, it was either over a bob dummy. I think it was over a bob dummy rather than a ballistic gel dummy. Um, but most of the cuts didn't get through the jacket. Whereas the stabs pretty much always do. So quite simply, stabs go through clothing much more easily than cuts do. Um, and you could say that is one of the contributory factors to leading to swords like the 1908 pattern cavalry sword design here, because whilst these technically were actually edged, um, you can't really cut with them very well because they're a very thick blade and not very good edge geometry for cutting, very narrow and thick. It's basically an S-stock. But for thrusting, they are superb because they're incredibly stiff, so they don't lose energy in, in penetration. Uh, they go deep into the target and easily, and they will easily go through clothing, even on foot, but especially on you know moving horse, where you don't need to apply any force with your arm to the sword blow. You just hold the sword out and let the speed of the horse do the work for you. So in that sense, uh, even if you were equipped with a sword, which is... A, let's say a compromise cut and thrust sword, you might be better placed very often to use the point. Now coming back to the spadroon, that does mean in a context where these were mostly used, so Europe and North America, admittedly they were used in India and other places as well, but that's more of a carryover because they were being used by British and French Portuguese forces, but primarily they were designed to be used by Europeans against other Europeans in a context where a certain degree of clothing would have been worn and in that context the thrust is much more easy to get through clothing than a cut would be. Now the question therefore comes up and this has been my concluding thought on this if you are equipped with a sword which is poor at thrusting because of aspects of its design like a talwa is so because of the disc pommel because of the curve because of the style of the blade it's just not particularly well suited to thrusting, although you can thrust with it. If you're equipped with a sword which uh, is predominantly a cutting sword um, and you're perhaps not going to thrust at all with it or barely at all, how do you fight someone? Say you're uh, an Indian um, sepoy or sowa fighting in Afghanistan, uh, either for Maratha or Sikh forces or uh, perhaps for uh, you know, the East India Company. For whatever reason, you're in Afghanistan, you're fighting Afghans in winter time. They are wearing poshtines, which are um, sheepskin gilets essentially turned inside out. So very, very warm, very, very padded. They've got a form of turban over their head. They've got thick coats maybe on as well. They had woolen coats that they wore additionally. So they're covered in um, essentially <laughs> leather and uh, wool and, uh, and sheepskin. 
How the hell, in some cases silk as well, which is incredibly difficult to cut through, what do you do with your tolwar against an Afghan who's additionally coming at you, fighting you, and who's got a shield, much like that one behind me? In fact, let's just whip it up. So if, if a person has got a shield and a uh, polwar or a tolwar uh, and is coming at you and they're completely covered, you have to consider at that point, it's not simply a question of trading blows like you maybe normally would. It is a question of looking for openings. And it's almost like they're armoured. And for all intents and purposes, they are armoured. Even the Napoleonic um, officer in wintertime to a degree, or even in, uh, sometimes in, in just, you know, um, summertime, to a degree is armoured. They are wearing a hat or a helmet. They are a shako. They are wearing a jacket. Uh, with a little gorget and they've got buttons and epaulettes and other things which are going to get in the way of giving a good cut. Um, so uh, in any of these situations you're going to be looking for openings in order to get your edge or your point into the opponent. And it's very challenging and often when we're sparring in HEMA or whether you do SCA or modern fencing or whatever we just think about a hit on the person is a hit. But actually, most fighting in warfare, whether the person is just wearing clothes or whether they're wearing elements of armour as well, they're going to be wearing hats, they're going to be wearing stuff on their body, might be wearing boots, which mean that cuts at their shins are not going to do very much through leather boots. So it's actually very, very challenging. And it's not simply about not being hit and scoring a hit. It's about scoring a hit that will actually do something, that will actually cause harm, either directly because of the nature of the blow you give, like a thrust through the clothing, or because your cut is so good and so powerful that it cuts through the clothing or armour that you're opposing. Um, or, even better, I would say, aiming for a place which is uncovered, like the face, for example. So if the Afghan in wintertime is wearing lots of woolen and um, uh, kind of sheepskin and leather clothing and with a turban on or perhaps even a helmet in some cases, aiming at the face, aiming at the hands, perhaps aiming at the thigh, because thighs tend to not have covering over them as much as the rest of the body. So thinking about those body targets and how you get to them, how you expose them and how you wound them, is actually a major part of certainly weapon-based um, martial arts training, or should be. And this should perhaps be something that we're considering more in our training, looking at a little bit more when we're looking at the sources as well, perhaps looking at which types of cuts and thrusts are favoured by certain weapons, by certain masters, in certain periods and places and times. Um, maybe some of the time, and we certainly know in John Musgrave Waite's time it was because he explicitly mentions it, Sometimes it is an important factor to consider when we're um, doing our training and doing our interpretations. Anyway, I hope that's been thought-provoking um, and a little bit interesting. Uh, please give me a like, give me a subscribe. If you've never subscribed to my channel, please do and click the notifications. I know that people have been unsubscribed for some reason. It happens on YouTube famously. And I know that a lot of people are not getting the notifications. Check out our Facebook page as well because I post up stupid memes there and also notifications about new videos that come out as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you really soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatorio channel. Bye folks! Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!